This is Pete Fletcher. Join us on this episode of Around the Galaxy for a conversation with author Adam Christopher. When you see a Star Wars book on the shelf, it's like, it's a Star Wars. So you have to meet the expectation without it being just written by committee. Ordinary thing. It has to be new. You're listening to Around the Galaxy. Welcome to episode number 124 of Around the Galaxy, the Star Wars fan talk show. I am your host, Pete Fletzer. Thank you so much for joining us. If this is your first visit with Around the Galaxy, well, thank you so much for joining us. Hope you enjoy the ride. And hey, even if you aren't new, make sure to hit that subscribe button because not only do you get Around the Galaxy once a week, we are also now dropping every single Saturday a Star Wars News Digest that we like to call Disturbances in the Force. Look, I know you have a life. I know you don't have time to keep up with all the Star Wars news that comes out. And and trust me, it's a lot of news. But I wrap it up for you in five minutes or less every single week. All you got to do is grab your coffee and open up your pod stream. And there we are, whether it's on Apple iTunes or Spotify or Stitcher or Podchaser or wherever you're listening to podcasts you will find Around the Galaxy and, again, on Saturdays, Disturbances in the Force. You can also keep up with us, hear about which guests are coming, and, uh, you know, keep up with the Star Wars conversation by following us on all your social media channels. You can catch us on TikTok. Yes, I said TikTok. You can catch us on Instagram. You can catch us on Facebook and, of course, Twitter, which is where I spend most of my life. All of those things, you can find us at ATGCast. You can also check out our website, atgcast.com and that's where you'll find all of our old episodes all the way back to the beginning two years two and a half years worth of content you can go check it out there you will also find links to our merch store and you will also find a link to become a member of around the galaxy you can join us on our patreon page patreon.com slash atgcast or just click the join atg button on atgcast.com what do you get with our patreon well there's various levels there's various forms various places that you can engage with us but for as little as three dollars a month our entry level membership you are going to get a link every single week to the video live stream when we record with our guests and and we pay attention to the chat we are monitoring what's going on and you'll hear in many of our episodes that we take questions or refer to comments from our viewers during the show so you can become a part of around the galaxy simply check out our patreon at patreon.com slash atgcast or again visit atgcast.com And when you're there, just click on the Join ATG button. Well, this week, I am excited to bring you an interview with Mr. Adam Christopher. Adam has written books for the TV show Elementary, Stranger Things. He's also written books for the Dishonored video game series. He's also written for Star Wars comic books and stories and from a certain point of view for A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. And he may or may not have another Star Wars book on the horizon. But without further ado, Mr. Adam Christopher. Adam, how are you? Hey, good. Always <laughs> happy to talk about Star Wars whatever time of day. That's for sure. <laughs> so Adam, so for the people who uh, may not know you that well, give us a little bit of your background. Yeah, so uh, I am a writer. Um, I, yeah, like... <laughs> the end. All right, great. Well, thank you. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. We'll look okay. <laughs> um, uh, You know, I write sort of science fiction um contemporary fantasy a little bit um i've done a lot of tie-in books so i've written for stranger things i did a novel called darkness on the edge of town Mm -hmm. yeah it's a chief hopper prequel um (laughs) i wrote a couple of books for elementary which is the you know modern day sherlock holmes uh tv show set in new york with johnny lee miller and Lucy Liu. Um, I've written a trilogy of books for Dishonored uh, video game series. Um, I've written comics, short stories, uh, my own novels. There's probably, this is kind of weird when I talk about it, like you do lose track, Hmm. which sounds stupid, but like it's true. But it's like a few trilogies. Um, I did a series called The Ray Electromagnetic Mysteries about a robot assassin and 1960s um hollywood and uh yeah i just kind of i've been doing this for probably 10 years now which is kind of crazy wow um it's interesting because you you you're (laughs) uh, what i love about it is it's it's sort of 
connections to uh, or different ways to write, right? You have the tie-in novels for television shows. You have the the tie-in Star Wars. You have the comic books. You have your own stuff. What what stuff do you prefer to write? What's your favorite kind of project to take on? That's an interesting question. I think um, I I love writing tie-ins <laughs> mm. um, or sort of work that's in a licensed kind of universe. You know, tie-ins had a had a bad reputation they used to be kind of seen as like a lesser form of writing somehow mm -hmm. like um you know movie novelizations were kind of which is kind of seen as this kind of lesser thing although back in the kind of 70s and 80s you know they sold by the million sure <laughs> um and you know they still exist today and then as opposed to novelizations, tie-ins where you're writing an original story set in that universe. Right. Um, which is actually the stuff that I've kind of done. I love doing it. Um, it's a different kind of writing to your to original material. And in a way, I think it's actually harder. Mm. Um, because like writing, like writing a book is quite hard. Like it takes a long time and they're long and you know, it's kind of blood, sweat, and tears. Mm. That's when it's your own story. When you've got a uh, tie-in, <clears throat> you have to write a coherent, entertaining, logical narrative mm -hmm. that is 100,000 words long, that it's original, but it fits in with whatever universe you're working in. Right. And although it has your own original characters, it has characters that already exist. Not only do they already exist, uh, if it's like TV or film, people love them. Right. And they are going to know instantly when, like, it's not working or when you get the characterization wrong mm -hmm. and they'll, like, they'll come down on you. So you have to create all this, this new material at the same time as being completely true to the property that you're writing in. Right. So in a way, you've got like six different jobs, whereas if it's your original, if you're original as in like your own material, like you're in charge. Right. And you create everything. And that's kind of easy. Have you been a fan of all the tie-in properties you worked in? And I imagine if if you are, that's probably part of the excitement is starting to build some of the lore for it. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. It's like uh, tie-in fiction and fan fiction are sort of related things hmm. but they're very different um you know i kind of came up as a doctor who fan back in new zealand uh where i'm from um sure i said that at the beginning i'm from new zealand um <laughs> but i live in the uk but like i was a big doctor who fan growing up and the first fiction that i ever wrote was um doctor who fan fiction um and i think being a Doctor Who fan, especially like in the 80s when I was growing up, you know, Doctor Who is a very literary kind of um, fandom because it has long, it has long association with novelizations mm -hmm. uh, published by Target Books. So Doctor Who fans have kind of always been, um, you know, reading and writing within that world. Right. Um, so that's like, that's part of why I like really love doing it because it's kind of my dream growing up reading Doctor Who books. It's like, although I haven't actually written anything Doctor Who related, hmm. I get to kind of do what my heroes were doing, um, you know, back then. But the, to the question of, like, um, am I a fan of the properties? It's like, I have been, mm -hmm. which has been an advantage. Sure. But at the same time, I don't think you, like, you don't have to be a fan of something to write it. Now, it's a bit different for books because the first ones I did were for elementary and... Like I was a huge fan of elementary. Mm -hmm. So in terms of nailing characterization and, and story format, because again, you know, like you write an elementary novel, well, it's got the characters that already exist that people right. love that they see on TV as a particular kind of story formula. And I think to really understand that you've got to be a fan, um, you know, and that applies to elementary, Dishonored, Stranger Things, Star Wars, mm -hmm. um, because you've got that super deep, connection with the property but then i kind of sometimes think about it and it's like well actually like if you are writing on a tv show and again this is not books but like if you're if you're a writer on a tv show 
Like, are you a fan of the show that you're writing on? <laughs> you know? It's a good question. If you're in a writer's yeah. room or, um, you know, I love comics if, and there's certain characters in comics that I like more than others. But like if DC or Marvel called me up and said, oh, can you write this whatever character? Like there's probably a chance that I'm a fan, but there's a chance that I'm not a fan. Right. Like, does that matter? And I'm, I kind of, it's a, it's a question I kind of juggle in my mind sometimes. Right. Because um, <clears throat> I think the danger also is, especially like the Star Wars, um, <laughs> being, a, being a fan as I am, and then writing in that universe, like you can get carried away. Right. And you have to remember that you're not writing necessarily for fans like yourself. You're writing for, you know, you're writing for a wider audience. There are fans, you know, hardcore fans as a part of that audience, but that's a small proportion compared to the kind of wider readership. I, well, I think that that's part of one of the, the interesting things too. Even, you know, you and I have, have, been in contact probably over the last five or six months and we've talked about just things even like happening in social media and that sort of thing and so the the connection there is is the you the i often have to remind myself that when there's a social media conversation about i don't know whether it's something positive or negative or controversial or whatever there's a very small group of people that fall into that while it may feel like this huge you know arena that we're playing in at the end of the day those that you know i, I think somebody who might read a, a book uh, a tie-in to stranger things is a very you know very concise very you know a, a limited group of people who are going to read that and so but you need to make sure that you're not writing it so that the even smaller group of you and your friends or you and the fan group that you're a part of are excited about. It. So that must make that that a bit of a chance because you have to make it accessible to anybody who's ever seen the show, I guess, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and the bigger the property, the more important that gets. Um, <clears throat> Stranger Things was a real challenge because I knew right from the start, obviously, that this is a book that's going to be on a, you know, someone's going to walk into a bookstore and they like Stranger Things because they've watched it on Netflix. Right. And they're going to see a book and it's going to have the Stranger Things logo on it and a picture of Chief Hopper and a picture of Eleven. Hmm. And like they're going to go, great, Stranger Things. And they'll pick it up like because they like Stranger Things. So it had to be a Stranger Things story. Like everything in there had to be true to Stranger Things and what it had to meet the expectations of this readership I'm not saying formula but like it, it had to be an original story that was still mm -hmm. could grip readers and had was entertaining and, and new and added something to the story that people already knew right so like i said you know the bigger the properties get the kind of more important it gets like star wars like well you know one of the biggest properties there is and you see a star wars book on the shelf it's like there's an expectation sure like, there's a star wars so you have to meet the expectation without it being just kind of this written by committee um you know ordinary thing it has to be new right so yeah it's different. and you know one of the reasons why i like writing tie-ins is because of you kind of this extra challenge this is peter townley and you're listening to around the galaxy your first star wars story was was it it was it the uh, was it end of watch in the uh in the the, was that the first uh, one yeah i think it, <clears throat> right that was what four years ago three years ago yeah that was in uh the from a certain point of view yeah uh this volume so how did how did you end up uh how, what was the process to to be selected for that because you know it's and that's one of the great things i think and, and i've been very lucky because i've spoken to a number of the authors in in the from a certain point of view books and for many it's their first foray into into Star Wars. So what was your story to, or what was your journey to get into, uh, into that particular collection? You know, I've wanted to write Star Wars for a long time and I was sort of lucky enough to be in a position where I could meet the editors and the team, um, at Delray. And actually my first meeting was like back in 2015 at mm. San Diego Comic-Con. Um, you know, because I'd been writing my own stuff for long enough that you kind of get on people's radars. I think, I did Stranger Things before, from a certain point of view, mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Maybe I didn't. 
No, maybe I did. Because the thing with like, because Stranger Things is Delray, and it's the same team of people. Okay. Yeah, Delray, Delray do Star Wars, Stranger Things, uh, World of Warcraft, mm-hmm. um, Minecraft. They're doing Critical Role. You know, loads of different cool properties. Yeah. Um. So I did. So Stranger Things was almost like an audition piece. Yeah. Then I got the kind of email uh, of my dreams. <laughs> um. That they were doing this anthology of you know anniversary anthology and where I do a story, and I think going back to the first one, it was like they had a list of ideas. Mm-hmm. You know, having explained the kind of concept, there's a list of ideas of um, the scene or that character, or you could you know do your own one. Um, and it was actually in the list. It was that conversation between. Han Solo and whoever it was on the other end of the communicator right. <laughs> when they raid the cell block. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I gotta do that story. That's so <laughs> it's like it's so obvious in a way. Um, you know, because it had been done on was it Robot Chicken? Yeah. Robot Chicken? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> Which is like it was just hilarious. Yeah. Like, yeah. I was like, okay, can I do a kind of serious version of that? Um so yeah, and then I I wrote that story. Um, which was a lot of, it was really cool because as I said, my first Star Wars mm-hmm. and I got to write, I know it's like the lines already existed because in the movie, but I got to write Han and I got to write Tarkin and Vader appears. Yep. And again, it's just a, whatever you see in the movie, the lines, but I kind of got a little uh, thrill. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be, that. it's, I mean, cause I think you're right. I think we all in a way, it, especially because star Wars has been around for so long and, and, you know, we grew up with it. And the fact like we all have this sort of, we, we might not have even thought about the story, but somewhere it exists in our brain that he was talking to somebody who was somewhere else on the death yeah. star doing something. And so what was that connection? And to be able to bring that to life must've been really very exciting. Yeah. And it's like, what is that conversation? Um, and you kind of get lost in this rabbit hole of, well, who was this other person? What was their job? Mm-hmm. With their co-workers because like it's a job like they're enlisted in the imperial navy or whatever but like it's a you know it's a career so right some kind of control <laughs> room there's like and what would happen if this guy called up and said there was a reactor leak right. he'd be like <laughs> okay maybe there is <laughs> <laughs> which is what they did in robot chicken they're like oh do we have a reactor in that level no yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure we could put one in. You know? um, <laughs> so you kind of just have to logically extrapolate from that little tiny little scene. Yeah. Which is the whole point of like from a certain point of view, which is why the, I think this book is so fabulous is because like what is going on that we don't see. I love the concept and I was so excited for the second one as well. Where And and the story you did there was The Witness. Oh, The Witness. The Witness. So which is yeah. such a cool <laughs> concept. Um, and I actually I reread it about a week ago. Um because I knew we were going to be talking and just speaking, I mean, it, I'm going to ask it this way. How is it to write sort of the conversation between Han and, and, and this, uh, this Imperial officer, but you had the person who was witnessing the, I am your father moment without putting it in, by the way, I thought yeah. that was very clever the way you, you kind of, you kind of danced around it. But I mean, how, did you want, did you recommend that story or did, or is well, that a story that was handed to you or? That was uh, a slightly different experience because I was doing Mandalorian and so I came in late to the Empire Strikes Back one and, um, you know, the options were whittling down. And they had that scene of, you know, the fight, the famous fight, like the most famous fight, one of the most famous fights in Star Wars history. Yeah. Uh, and like the, and again, this is like one of the most classic lines in cinema history sure like, right it goes star beyond wars. star wars absolutely yeah. yeah but the problem is they couldn't figure out like no one was going to take that story because like there's no one else there there's just the two of them on this gantry like in the middle of cloud city mm-hmm. no one could figure out how to do it <laughs> <laughs> so i'm like sure yeah <laughs> I I, i'll do that. i'll take that i'll figure it out because <laughs> it was more that i was so attracted to that like this is you know i'm your father moment mm-hmm. i thought that it's got to be in the book. Like, this is Empire Strikes Back. You've got to have that. Yeah. So I came up with an idea that there's a, a stormtrooper lost in the kind of workings of the, <laughs> of the Cloud City. Yep. They're kind of stuck in the pipes. Um, <laughs> and they overhear this conversation. And they they kind of see the battle and they overhear the conversation. But again, it was like, 
you know, not many people in the Star Wars universe know the relationship between Vader and Luke at that point. Right. Like it's it's the viewer, you forget as the viewer, we're privy to privy to like the most important moments between the most important characters in that galaxy. Right. Which is like that's not what people know about and if you are living it. Yep. So it was like, okay, you can have this conversation where Vader and Luke are talking, but like the person can't really hear right. <laughs> all of it. Um, so it's like, okay, so it's windy <laughs> and they're kind of stuck. And, you know, because the person stormtrooper, if you imagine this, so the stormtrooper in the story um, is one of the contingent on Cloud City, who's one of Vader's bodyguard. Mm-hmm. And she's actually one of the two troopers who tortures Han in, with that machine. Um I still wish I knew how that device worked because it just yeah. looks just looks horrible. Like, yeah, just like <laughs> electricity. Um, and it's funny because the other stormtrooper in that scene is also in the story, and like he's he's like a total psycho. <clears throat> well, that's so, I you know I I didn't want to sidetrack you, but that's one of the things that I love about your story is you have this fanatic stormtrooper. I think you call them a believer, right? I mean, that's like, yeah, he's, and he's, he's like, <laughs> you know, especially in in today's world just this concept of somebody who is so committed to like and it's an interesting concept too because i imagine never having been in the armed forces i mean you probably have people who are there um who are so committed to the cause and that's why they did it and there's people who are there because you know it was going to pay for college and uh oh i ended up in a war or whatever it might be but just it was an interesting uh sort of approach and in fact i thought that was what was really interesting to me about the story here i am i'm reviewing your story in front of you but one of the things i loved about it was i thought that's where the story was going i thought it was going to be you know let's let's get to know both these guys and and the differences but of course it was what the differences that sort of triggered for for your yeah. protagonist it's this is not for me they kind of cuz they did there's differences but the similarities like they're both uh so i can't remember the operating number but um, the main character, they're both like, so he's like the total zealot and is really into the idea of empire. And she's like, just, she's a career trooper, but right. um, it's more just like the vocation of, of service. And they're both, the, the differences are that their beliefs are completely different, but the similarities are that they're both really good at the job, which is why right. they get assigned to be Vader's bodyguard on occasions. Um, but yeah, and it's the differences, and in fact, it's his it's his behavior that, or his demeanor that is kind of what pushes her finally to decide to quit mm-hmm. or desert in the middle of the chaos on Cloud City. Yeah, <clears throat> which is how she gets stuck down the service ways and sees the kind of the confrontation. Yeah. Um, but there was an interesting story to write because again, it's like when you analyze. The movie and the, those those peripheral characters who exist in the background. It's like, what do they know, and what don't they know? Because they're not they're not us, the viewer. Right. So, like, <clears throat> did you know who Luke was? Like, there's an X-wing pilot who's coming. Mm-hmm. Vader Vader is obsessed with this X-wing pilot, but like, what's the relationship, and why? You know, why is he testing this? That the carbon freezer on Han mm-hmm. like why would he use it in the first place so the kind of you know this interesting thing about um, being involved in such key moments that for us key moments in Star Wars but like for people who are there uh, pretend it's real um, mm-hmm. their, their point of view is completely different right um, and I think that was one of the things that was attractive about even like Claudia Gray's Princess of Alderaan was just sort of that kind of you know, we see it, it was that, a similar point of view in that it was, um, you know, we know the story because we've watched all the movies and we're fans. But <laughs> right. the people who live there, it's it's and that's, I think, also why they from a certain point of view books work really well. And I I hope when they do the 40th for, for Jedi, it'd be great if they could like you could get that character back. And now she's a full on rebel. And I don't know, she's on. Emperor well, it's or something. Like, yeah, I'd like to get. um if it's. If it's four five one back in some way, yeah, he was actually like he's only in it a little bit, but like he's so kind of nasty. Yeah, <laughs> he's like he's really bad. There's something attractive <laughs> about writing that type of character too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. I remember there's this like 
spoiler, but like he has his um his operator number tattooed on his chest. <laughs> like when he's off duty, he walks around, he has his tunic and he like he's cut it so right. it's open. You can see it. <laughs> and I remember the comments in the edit was like, This guy is is nuts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, Yeah, that's right. He, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I thought that was yeah, that's what made him so interesting too. And and again, that's why I, I'm glad you know, again, here I am reviewing your story in front of you. But it's I like that it sort of was that um that's kind of what pushed her over because you, you know, we've all known both those people, right? We've known, you know, I mean, hopefully we don't know people who are like just hell bent on burning down villages like he was, but that's <laughs> maybe not. But certainly people who are who have an extreme perspective on something, and and I think that that's that yeah. was cool. And it also kind of shows a little crack in the empire, right? Is that it's, um, you know, when we're kids and we see stormtroopers, they're just a bunch of white uniforms but you know white armor and whatnot but and as we've gotten to know the story over the years it's humanized and of course finn as the most human stormtrooper we ever saw um made it for made for a very interesting kind of story to Mm -hmm. tell and and that's what makes those that's why i i too i'm with you i'm i love the certain point of view books i think they're they both of those are among my top star wars books This is Jason Fry. You're listening to Around the Galaxy. So you grew up in New Zealand. What was your first Star Wars experience? What is what is it? Uh, how did you get exposed to it? What were some of your first memories? I mean, I know I know technically what my first exposure was. Um, I saw Star Wars: A New Hope. Uh, not the not the first screening, mm-hmm. but the second screening, which was 1978. Okay. Um, and I was six months old, and <laughs> Yeah, um, it's one of those things. Like back in those days, um, movie releases were kind of different to how they are now. They were staggered across different regions, different territories. Mm-hmm. Um, New Zealand is kind of out of the way a little bit, especially back then. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know, um, even in the eighties, we were getting, you know, whatever your top-rated kind of US TV show was, we'd get it like three years later. Mm. Which today seems kind of like wild. Why would you do? Yeah, yeah. Um, so Star Wars was re-released in New Zealand in August 1978, mm. or thereabouts, which is kind of tied in with the school holidays, because um, yeah, the school holidays. And my dad is really into science fiction, and uh, he wanted to see this movie, <laughs> so I was as as the story goes, I was taken along. <laughs> So, like, that's. I apologize now if anyone was at the either the New Lynn or the Avondale cinemas uh, <laughs> one afternoon in August 1978, because, you know, taking a six month old to um, the movies is not a good idea, really. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry for that noisy. Um, it was you. So, yeah, so there's like, yeah, it was me. <laughs> so, that was my first, the first movie I ever went to, was Star Wars. Mm. Uh, which kind of doesn't get any better than that. I can't remember it, obviously, because I was six months old. Sure. <laughs> um, my first cinematic memory is actually Return of the Jedi. Hmm. And I think I have this feeling that that was 1984. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know when, because I know the, obviously the original release was 83. Right. Uh, I don't, can't remember offhand what time of year. But in New Zealand, again, I think it was like a big summer holiday. So it might have been early 84. I can't remember. Uh, but I remember that distinctly. I went with my friend from school, and I was six years old. Mm. Um, I was already a Star Wars fan, and I, again, I don't know how or why. I have no memory of Empire Strikes Back. Mm. Um, later on, my dad worked in advertising, and um, you know, VHS machines were really expensive, but his the company he worked for obviously had loads of them. So he would borrow them every weekend <laughs> and rent, go to a local video store yeah. and rent Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back. And it got to the point sometime in the 80s where like Friday night he would just show up with the VCR from work <laughs> and Empire, he'd just gone to the video store and borrowed it, rented it. You know, no point me going down and trying to choose a movie because... I would have just chosen Empire. So like every Friday, probably every weekend for like, I don't know, three years, four years. Right. I've watched Star Wars. So I suspect my my first proper 
you know, uh, exposure to Star Wars and Empire was on video. Um, it's, you know, lost in my memory somewhere. Sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, <clears throat> I was sort of, you know, and because my dad worked in advertising, he went on lots of business trips to places like Japan and China where Star Wars toys were, I think, manufactured. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this is the old days. <laughs> it was a long <laughs> way away. So I think although like Star Wars was just as much a phenomenon in New Zealand as it was everywhere else, maybe the range of toys was limited or slower to release. So like he'd come back with, with suitcases full of toys that like I'd never mm -hmm. dreamed of. Um, and I still remember unpacking i remember unpacking the x-wing ah. uh you know the box and everything and like putting the stickers on and you had the stickers which were the kind of the clean decals and then there was the kind of battle damaged carbon scarring mm -hmm. and like debating whether i keep it clean or whether i put the things on which but, way did you go do you remember uh carbon scoring oh uh, yeah i think yeah. You, i think you chose wisely yeah yeah because it's like it's <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, I had a huge collection of Star Wars toys, um, you know, thanks to my dad's trips, mostly, I think, um, you know, because Star Wars was hot property. Yeah. And this is like, this is probably now 85, 86. Mm -hmm. um, New Zealand is kind of an interesting place because uh, although it's obviously very British, being part of the Commonwealth, its proximity to the States means that we got a real mix of kind of British and American influences. Mm. Really things like TV, because, you know, I was kind of addicted to Doctor Who, for example. Right. Um, but we also got, you know, Transformers and G.I. Joe and Mask, um, He-Man, mm. um, like very quickly. Um, you know, weird things like we got the American version of Fraggle Rock. Because like Fraggle Rock, the human segment in the lighthouse right. was regional. Um, okay. So when I moved to the UK in 2006, uh, somehow I like came into contact with Fraggle Rock again. I was like, wait, this is different. Like this guy is different. And, <laughs> uh, but we got the American version in New Zealand. So, you know, I was into, I had a huge collection of Transformers. And GI yeah. Joes. Did you stick with Star Wars when it went to the sort of dark times? Did you read the books or did you kind of like a lot of people <clears throat> kind of fade out until the special editions and prequels came? I think I kind of faded out, but um, I don't remember the books being particularly visible, mm. uh, you know, because I was still a Doctor Who fan, and as I said, Doctor, really, Doctor Who has got a long tradition of books, so I was collecting and probably focusing on Doctor Who books, mm -hmm. um, you know, which continued, you know, the original series of Who finished in 89, right. and then, you know, the in the, from the the 90s to the new series you know there's the new adventures and the missing adventures and the bbc books and you know so i was busy reading those and wanting to write them like so writing doctor who fan fiction right thinking one day i could write a doctor who book um but yeah and then star wars came back it was first with the special edition which i saw at the cinema in 1997 okay i remember queuing up with my friends and being blown away by the updated <laughs> version of Star Wars. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's like, it's, it kind of faded, but it was always there. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And then of course, uh, the, the prequels came into everybody's world. And what was your, what was your response to the prequels? Um, I mean, I think everybody's gotten their own sort of special, special thoughts on it, but I mean, does it, did, uh, did they strike you? I mean, I don't, I'm trying to do the math in my head about how old you were. You were probably about 20 when they uh, came out. 99 was the first yeah time. so it was like 21 yeah right right um yeah the phantom menace i love the phantom menace mm -hmm. uh and that film i think for me is the record of the number of times i went to see a movie at the movies <laughs> i think i saw it nine times uh when it came out in 99 um and i just yeah i loved it yeah like, it probably wasn't what I expected. Right. And I don't think anyone expected what we got. Right. But I, like, totally, like, loved it. It feels, and today, I love the prequels because they feel like 
this is George Lucas's Star Wars. Yeah. Um, there's just something about them. You know, I you know, I, I love Vanda Menace. I like Attack of the Clones a bit less. I love Revenge of the Sith. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but I'd seen, I think, because I was sort of busy at university, so I saw, uh, you know, Phantom Menace nine times. Then I think Attack and Revenge, I saw once or twice because I did, didn't have time. Right. Because that that's getting up to, I think, Revenge was 2005, mm-hmm. um, at which point I was actually had finished university and I was at work. So, um, Attack was so you probably couldn't just go to the movies nine times. No, I had no, to. <laughs> and because Attack of the Clones, I actually had the least memory of in the movies because I think that was right when I was doing my master's degree. So it's like my brain has no space for anything. <laughs> um, hey, this is Luthien from Girls with Sabers, and you're listening to Around the Galaxy. I tend to to avoid conversations much on the sequels because of the fact that they're still in that. That's where we were 20 years ago. Like there were people, oh, yeah. I mean, you yeah. literally had that people versus George Lucas documentary <laughs> and just like people who are so mad about it. And there's people who still are so mad about parts of the sequels, but the sequels feel very different to me. The way I put it is they have a bit of a, a Marvel universe feeling to, especially rise of Skywalker with like the very fast cuts and the, the, it's just a very different style, which maybe in 20 years when my kids go back and they watch them, maybe to them it'll just feel like one cohesive story. Yeah, um, I think you're probably right. You know, I, and thinking about it now, you know, I think the prequels, they did feel very different mm-hmm. at the time, and now they don't. But as I find, you know, watching movies even from 10 years ago, which is nothing because we're old now, <laughs> um, but like they feel like there's, there's a difference between a 10 year old movie and a movie from today yeah so i think as time passes and the sequel trilogy kind of ages i think well it may have that same kind of i don't know how you describe it like a, a joining of the star wars feel um things like because i was when i watched phantom menace recently little things seems so star wars like <laughs> and it's tiny things which mean nothing like when uh obi-wan and uh liam neeson they arrive on the on the ship at the beginning the trade federation and like there's a silver protocol droid who is there to serve them refreshments right which is this kind of female voice but it looks exactly like c-3po because it's yep. a you know they're the same class of protocol droid <clears throat> and it moves the same and it's kind of just silver but like it's nothing but somehow that feels super star wars but right. i don't know why i can't really explain it and it's kind of maybe it's the fact that like the death star droid from the original trilogy right was a silver 3po unit which right. you see briefly, like walking down the corridor so little connections like that yeah you know. and the sequel and- trilogy has the same kind of little connections which i think will become will become more um obvious as time passes perhaps i i think you're right and, and i think that and that's yeah it's and that's one thing that i think george has has always done so very well is just sort of recognize that the background is as important as the foreground without making the background uh pop too much right and uh, and i think that that's i mean i always remember i read a starlog magazine before return of the jedi which i'm just sure you you read those as well but before return of the jedi i remember there was an article or maybe it was just after either way but it was about shooting jabba's sand barge and he said something to the effect of you know you shouldn't get so hung up on showing your set pieces just because you made them or something along those lines and and i think that's why star wars feels the way it does but it leads me to an interesting question that i love to 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 ask people who are especially people who are in that in that world from a story creation standpoint, you know, now that we've allegedly moved past the Skywalker saga, what, and maybe as you work on your next project, maybe you can, you know, maybe this is a question you've asked yourself is what makes something star Wars? What, what separates it from, you know, Dune or alien or close encounters or ET or, or whatever, what makes it not just science fiction? Um, what what makes a Star Wars movie or a Star Wars story a Star Wars story? There's kind of two two ways of looking at it. Like the first thing, there's this it's just this in, un, undefinable um, 
quality. And, you know, you can ask the same question, like what makes a Stranger Things story? Mm. What makes an elementary story? I mean, this is my, just my experience with writing in those universes. And I think, yeah, okay, what, what is Star Wars that's not just science fiction? There are obvious things that, uh, I mean, it's almost a cliche, like the whole thing of like the Star Wars universe feels lived in mm-hmm. and used. You know, spaceships are, if they're not dirty and kind of pieces of junk, hmm. they've got switches and levers. There's an old fashioned quality about it. Mm-hmm. Um, even though it's kind of, I mean, I've, you know, <clears throat> a long time ago in the galaxy, far, far away, but right. there's this kind of very manual, mechanical, old fashioned feel. Um, it's funny, I was thinking about this the other day. It's like they've got, you know, Holonet and holographic communications and entertainment, uh, you know, instantaneous across the galaxy, ship to ship and planet and all this kind of stuff. But like there's no Star Wars social media. Like there's no there's no Twitter <laughs> in the galaxy far, far away. Thank which God. in a way <laughs> but in a way that feels even though they've got this advanced technology where it's possible, like that feels like it's a it's a part of an older world. Right. You know, we're old enough to remember the analog world mm-hmm. you know, before the internet even. Uh, and Star Wars kind of like the pre it's like before the internet. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. except they've got like spaceships and droids and fast and light travel and all this kind of really super advanced technology right so it's kind of and this again again it's more of a almost a cliche that you know star wars was so heavily influenced by things like flash gordon and serialized science fiction of the 40s mm-hmm. complete of the scrolling text and all that right kind of stuff which has continued and Although the you know, the prequel trilogy is now how many years old? Twenty something. Twenty two years was when the first one came out. Yeah, is that crazy? Yeah. <laughs> and you know the sequel trilogy, still brand new, right? But it still keeps that quality of it's a it's an an older. It sounds like it sounds stupid when you say it because like obviously it's a long time ago, but like it's an older type of science fiction. Mm-hmm. It's an older view of space opera. Right. Space opera being aliens and planets and spaceships. Um, so, like, yeah, that is kind of Star Wars. And it's different to a lot of other science fiction. Like, you look at movies that came out around the same time mm-hmm. as a response to Star Wars. It's like, oh my God, Star Wars, we've got to do something. <laughs> You get things like black, the black hole. Yeah, mm. funny you said that one because that was the first one that came to mind when you said right. that. Yeah, and on TV, Battlestar Galactica. Mm-hmm. Um, they're completely different to Star Wars. Yeah, like in every way possible. They've got spaceships, aliens, planets, robots, but like there's nothing about them remotely like Star Wars. Right. And I think, and those are the ones we remember. I mean, there must be loads of movies and TV shows that came that were trying to do Star Wars that no one remembers because they were terrible. And, and you know, so it's like, that's where it comes back to that kind of the the undefinable, undefinable, indefinable, undefinable <laughs> um, thing about about whatever property it is, whether it's Star Wars or Star Trek or Doctor Who or something. Like, there's something in there, and that's part of the reason why those universes are the ones that are still around with us mm-hmm. something in there that that not only people like and identify with and want more of but there's something different about it that is not it's not easily replicated and it and it's and because it's not easily replicated like it doesn't exist in other kind of properties right but that goes down to the kind of dna of these things like what makes doctor who doctor who it has a completely original concept, obviously, mm-hmm. but but beyond that concept, there is something in it that exists between between the light. Like you know, someone said, what makes a what makes a best selling book, Stephen King book, or you know, uh, James Patterson or something, is mm-hmm. like it's it's it exists between the lines 
on the page. Right. It's like an X factor that you know it's there, but you can't like, what is it? You can pull apart a Stephen King book and try and figure out what makes it work. And you just come up with what plot characters, the yeah. quality of the writing, you know, mechanical things. But you can then take all those mechanical pieces and try and put them together and you're not going to write a Stephen King book. Right. So it's the kind of same kind of thing with Star Wars, like what makes Star Wars Star Wars? And uh, which, <laughs> when it comes to writing Star Wars or any kind of tie-in property, that's where, as I said at the beginning, like tie-ins are not for everybody as a writer right. because like you have to somehow hone in on whatever that factor is right and try and reproduce it because you've you know i'm sure all of us have read bad fan fiction good mm -hmm. good fan fiction bad fan fiction good tie-ins bad tie-ins you know the worst kind of tie-in is when it's like it's a perfectly good story perfectly well written but it doesn't feel like what it's supposed to be right the universe is. Hi, I'm Sean Tennant, and this is Around the Galaxy. Do you, do you feel a sort of different pressure when you're writing Star Wars because it meant so much to you growing up? Obviously, it still means a lot to you based on you know your your collection behind you and that sort of thing. But do you is it is it a different kind of pressure, or is it or you know do you find it maybe even easier because it's it's you know it so well? Yeah, it's kind of both. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously the pressure because I want it, you know, whatever I write, whatever I write, I want it to be good. Sure. And whatever I write, I want it to be better than what I've written before, because you know that's the whole point. Surely, is that <laughs> you find new stories and new ideas and new ways of doing things. And yeah, as a fan, I, you know, I want to contribute something that's meaningful and worthwhile and is good, and that other fans will like, while also appealing to more casual fans. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, which is where the balance between that kind of like, it's not fan fiction, <laughs> right? but it's not just a story. It's somewhere in the middle. Um, so yeah, so being a fan helps, but yeah, it does come with a kind of personal pressure. This again, it's like the reason why tie-ins are hard to get into perhaps mm -hmm. is because you need this, you need to have built up a kind of, experience of writing and not just in terms of oh you can write a book and you can hit a deadline but like knowing what you're capable of and how you react to things it's like okay writing star wars is high pressure i want to do a good job is my book going to be good do i you know with stranger things i was like i'm gonna write a stranger things prequel it's got to be a stranger things book because other people are gonna like be really disappointed but but putting the, the, the ability to be able to put that aside mm -hmm. And like, okay, I can write this book. I know what I'm doing. I've done it before. I've written lots. I I know how to write a book. I know how to write a book that, I mean, the first draft is terrible, but like <laughs> maybe after a few revisions, it's all right. And other people will like it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's like, you can easily get lost in the kind of, I guess it's not quite confidence, but you get lost in the kind of, the idea of, you get lost in the idea of writing a, Stranger Things book. Right, right. It's like, you know, it's probably the, one of the most exciting things is doing the outline, because like for any tie-in book, you have to write an outline, and it has to be quite detailed, because again, a lot of people uh, are going to be reading it, because if you're writing something that fits into a universe that already exists, like it mm -hmm. has to be, you know, it has to fit. Um, so the outline's really detailed, and like, that's where you get that kind of, you get the fan stuff out of the way. Mm-hmm. He's like, oh my God, I'm writing a scene and it's got this character and this character who I never dreamed I'd ever be able to write. And right. it's, it's amazing and so exciting. And I can put in my favorite other character and they could do this and they could meet this and, you know, all that stuff. <clears throat> you just kind of get it out, throw it down at the outline, enjoy the moment, enjoy it. Because like, you know, I do this because I like doing it for a start. Right. Um, and then you can refine it and you kind of go, you drift from the fan to the professional and you kind <laughs> of make sure everything's lining up and, you know, you, you, you know, maybe that character doesn't have to be in the movie, in the, in the book. Maybe you can actually just, you know, well, he was in the outline and he did a good job, but maybe it's time just to put him away and, you know, 
um, yeah, so like the outline and then the writing of the book itself, you know, is, is almost the kind of, that's the slog. Right. That's like, how do I translate this outline into a finished book? You know, and, and again, this is why they get people who have experience because, you know, my first drafts are terrible. <laughs> um, I get to a point halfway through where I'm like, what, what other jobs could I do? You know, I wanted to be a truck driver when I was about eight years old. It's like, is it too late? Um, <laughs> surely anything's better. But that happens in every book. You know? Sure. Um, yeah. And I know, and I can, I can keep going and, you know, um, but yeah. Do you, I, it's interesting because you, you, you and I were going back and forth a little bit this morning and, and you just casually dropped, I'm starting work on the book today. So is it like, is it like a, a nine to five job? Do you like, do you, you get your self ready and then you, you just sort of today I'm, I'm going to start my new job or, or is it like, have you been like, have you held yourself back from starting or, or what, what does that kind of process look like? No, I think I, I mean, it's a job, right? Right. So whether it's a tie-in book, or whether it's my own stuff, um, or if it's a comic or a novel or a short story, you know, it's a job. So I really stick to kind of normal office hours. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say I'm writing from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. like sure. nonstop, but like, and I, yeah, I try not to work on weekends unless I have a deadline approaching and I have got behind, mm -hmm. um, you know, but it's just sort of, I try and keep it disciplined and um, not not to kind of do so much, because yeah, I enjoy doing it, but like not to do so much that I kind of burn myself out. Right. So right. I'm very, I'm a very scheduled sort of person. Um, and especially with tie-ins, keep talking about tie-ins, <laughs> Star Wars, um, <laughs> yeah. because you're working to a very strict timeline. So it's quite easy to work out your schedule and what you have to do and you know different time points and especially again comes back to experience like i know how long it takes me to write a book mm -hmm. and i know i'll be fast at this point and then i'll be slow and then i'll be fast and then i know how long it takes me to revise at the end which are all kind of um you know factors that are taken into consideration when they're looking for people to do tie-ins sure um Right. To your point, it's, you know, the tie in book is a little bit more. Is there may be less freedom, right? Because they're tying it into other things, right? They're trying to make sure that it's connected to, you know, the launch of a, a, a new series or, yeah. or a new game or something like that. So, but again, yeah. that's like, that's a puzzle, right? Especially because like, you know, Stranger Things was, um, it was going to be a, uh jim hopper prequel novel mm -hmm. set in new york city when he was a cop in new york city um because i think it's in season two of stranger things 11 finds that box under the floorboards right which has got new york written on the side of it so it's like well what's in that box that's his kind of you know his archive of his time as a cop and that was kind of it so mm -hmm. like that's like a paragraph less than that two sentences that's the story right so i had to create something from that um for other things like dishonored my books the three books there's, there's uh i think three games and various kind of dlcs and things mm -hmm. so the books had to span the gaps in time between the games so that had a very particular function mm. and there were very particular things I had to kind of, you know, things that appear in the first game and the second game that I had to kind of link together. Right. So that was kind of a more detailed sort of brief. Um, and then elementary was the books slot into the seasons of elementary as if they were episodes. Hmm. So I, the way I treated those was like, well, the book is longer than a TV episode. So this sure. is the kind of the mid season two part special <laughs> And where there's a cliffhanger and and yep. everyone goes away and it comes back in six weeks. Um, so that was more, well, that was even a lesser kind of brief because it's like, well, write an elementary story. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The producer's going, we assume you know elementary, so write a story. 
go watch the show and yeah. tell us a story from it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In fact, for elementary, I had to do an audition chapter. Um, that was that was crazy because the first book to kind of I know it's not Star Wars, but to explain what happened was like I knew that my publisher Titan were doing elementary books because <clears throat> I Titan had bought uh, a trilogy, space opera trilogy. So I had gone down to London and met with them, and it was all great. And I kind of just overheard they were doing elementary, and I was like, I'm a massive fan of elementary. I'd love to do yes. elementary. And they're like that's great, but like, they're all done, tied up. Someone's doing them, you know? So I was like, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> um, and then six weeks later, my agent emailed and was like, do you still want to do an elementary book? I was like, yeah, sure. And then they're like, great. The condition is you've got three weeks to write the first book. Well, um, because whatever happened, uh, they gave the books to me and the first book, I had three weeks to write it. Wow. Um, three weeks to write it. The outline was extra, but like because CBS were like, we need this book really quickly. <laughs> Are you sure this person knows what elementary is? So I had to do an audition sort of chapter, which was, you know, the first couple of chapters, and it had to have the main characters in it, mm-hmm. you know, Sherlock and Watson. And it kind of they had to review that to make sure. And then as soon as they saw that, they were like, yeah, okay, you know, it's what elementary is. <laughs> how it works. Um, and yeah, but that was like then that was then that was three weeks to do the book, which was crazy. Wow, um, but it's yeah. kind of good sometimes. Pressure, you know, tight deadlines and pressure is sometimes good, right? You know, because it's like you you really your your creative energies go into overdrive. Um, exhausting, but yeah, fun. yeah. I mean, it doesn't give you much time to worry. You just got to go do it. <laughs> yeah. well, the thing it's like it comes down to like writing as a job. And like, right. okay, I guess it's an art and a craft and people take a lot of time over it. And I've taken a lot of time over books, but like sometimes you're hired to do a job mm-hmm. and a lot of people are depending on you to do it. <laughs> right. And like they want, you have to do what they, they're expecting because they hired you to do it. Yep. Um, but yeah, I, as I said, I love that kind of thing. But uh well, Adam, thank you so much. This was a, a ton of fun. I, I took up a lot of your time. I apologize. I just kept going. Um, but Adam, where can uh, people find you online and keep up with that? Can we say that you're, you you will have a Star Wars book coming out at some point? I can confirm nor deny. Neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> okay. Well, in the event that that happens, or you just want to keep up with, you know, the guy who's written some amazing uh, books on uh, uh, some of the stories for uh, Star Wars, some comics, some Stranger Things, some some Elementary, some Dishonored. Where can somebody <laughs> keep up with you? Um, so yeah, Twitter mainly. Um, uh, where I'm a ghost finder, which is canonical in Star Wars. I was made, uh, there's a whole entry on Wikipedia <clears throat> with um, the great battle between the Sith Armada and the ghost finder fleet. Oh, wow. Ancient times that um, Admiral Akbar reminisces about um, in one of the Aftermath books. I think, I think it's the middle one. Like, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, same on Twitter, pretty much. Um, and I've got a, my website is um, adamchristopher.co.uk. Excellent. It just has my stuff on it. And I don't have a blog or anything. Um, but yeah, that's where there will be news. That's awesome. Well, Adam, thank you so much. This was great. And uh, I look forward to uh, talking to you again sometime. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Around the Galaxy. If you had fun, please like, subscribe, share, and review it. If you really had fun and would like to be part of the live virtual audience, please check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash ATGcast. Make sure to follow us on Twitter or all your social media at ATGcast, and go to our website, atgcast.com, for more information about the show, merch, and all kinds of great links. Around the Galaxy is copyright 2021 Pete and the Seed Studios, and our music is by the band Silver Colored Knob, which can be found wherever you find music. <laughs>